Hello and welcome. So in this series of slides, I cover the principles of microeconomics. And therefore, for this first lecture, I'm beginning with the foundations and basic principles that we need to go forth in the course. So we begin with a definition. Economics is a study of how people make choices while attempting to satisfy their unlimited wants with scarce limited resources. Right, so the idea is people make choices, they face trade-offs, trying to deal with scarcity. And we're going to develop these ideas in a little bit. First, just to get expectations correct, there's a distinction we have to draw between microeconomics and macroeconomics. So microeconomics deals with individuals, firms, households, and specific markets. So with microeconomics, we're thinking about competition, monopoly, um, and different sorts of topics involving strategy between firms. With macroeconomics, we're thinking of the economy as a whole. So there we're thinking about unemployment, real GDP, uh, inflation, fiscal policy, um, tax cuts, uh, government spending increases, and then monetary policy, Federal Reserve. Those are all macroeconomic topics, and that's not what we're doing here. Okay, so economics um, are based around choice. And so by choices, we mean the decisions that are made by individuals, both about what to do and what not to do. And in order to go a little bit further, we're going to need to articulate some basic principles to provide a foundation. So that's going to be the goal of this series of slides. My main advice here, pay attention to where and how these principles are being applied throughout the course. Each of these principles shows up in the later uh, in the later lectures, although I, I won't always refer to them directly. Also, more generally, in studying economics, it can be really important to master the definitions, and that can be accomplished sometimes most effectively by going back to uh, flashcards or two-column notes or whatever it takes so that you can have full command of the definitions. One thing that students often overlooked with definitions in economics is that they are really precise. And the reason why they're so precise is because our definitions um, are standing in for uh, mathematics and for a quantitative analysis that we bring to life using graphs and tables and figures later in the course. And it's important to appreciate the precision of these definitions both so that those things make sense and then also so that you can truly internalize the concepts. Often when students have trouble with microeconomics, it uh, comes down to a failing to recognize the precision of definitions. Okay, so the first principle, choices are necessary because resources are scarce. So think back to our basic definition of economics. People make choices over how to use scarce limited resources. And the basic idea is, well, when people have a finite collection of resources and an infinite a uh, number of uses for those resources, you have to make some hard choices, face trade-offs about how to use those resources towards one use or the other. By resource, we mean anything that can be used to produce something else. So we'll think about resources very broadly, time, attention span, focus, motivation, these all qualify as resources and are therefore subject to scarcity. So to illustrate, Choices are necessary because resources are scarce. Here's an example. We only have 24 hours in a day. There's many things we'd want to accomplish, and we have to make choices about how to use this finite block of time. Second principle. This is a really important one, which is portable. We can use this in other areas of life. It's one of the important contributions of economic uh, thought and of the economic framework to use outside of economics even. It's that the true cost of something is its opportunity cost. Opportunity costs measure what is given up to get something. It's the value of your next highest alternative. Opportunity costs measure sacrifice. So is the alternative, the value of the alternative foregone when you choose one thing instead of another? And opportunity costs are absolutely crucial to understanding individual choices. See, all choices um, involve trade-offs. You can do one thing or you can do the other, and those trade-offs uh, bring with it costs. We mean uh, This means we are always giving something up when we make a particular choice, right? So we choose one thing in, instead of another, we are making a sacrifice. You can no longer do that other thing, and that's the opportunity cost. So for example, 
Suppose a friend offers you a concert ticket for free. You might be tempted to think that going to the concert is costless, though that's not true. In terms of money, yeah, you don't have to make a cash outlay to obtain that ticket. The, amount, the money that you're spending on the ticket is zero if you're just given it for free, but the true cost of attending has to include the value of your time that you're giving up. I mean, you could have been spending this doing something else, studying, working out, many other things. So the true cost of attending the concert includes the foregone ability to use that time to do something else. So your opportunity cost includes not only the money, in this case zero, but also the value of the other resources that you're using for that particular activity. Another principle, how much is a decision at the margin? Really important contribution of economic thought is the idea of uh, marginal reasoning leading to optimization, leading to optimal choice. So the idea is that people face trade-offs and make decisions on the margin. You ought to compare the costs and benefits of doing a little bit more of an activity versus doing a little bit less. If the benefit of doing a little bit more exceeds the cost of doing a little bit more, you should do more of that activity. But if the cost of doing a little bit more of the activity exceeds the benefit, you should reduce how much you're doing. You've optimized when the cost of doing more matches the benefit of doing more, because then you should neither increase nor decrease how much you're doing. So we assume economic agents optimize by comparing the costs and benefits and choosing the course of, act of action that maximizes their well-being. So for example, suppose you have an exam coming up. You'd also like to work out. You choose between these two things and you have to determine how to spend your time. So what do you do? Well, you, spend the, you compare the benefit of spending one more hour on either activity. So the benefit of studying might be potentially higher grades uh, versus the cost of spending that hour studying. Well, the foregone ability to do that other activity. Well, if the benefit of potentially higher grades exceeds the cost of giving up other things you could use that time for, well, then you better use that time to study. Another principle, people respond to incentives, exploiting opportunities to make themselves better off. So people respond to incentives is an important principle of economics, the idea that um, people can often respond to incentives in ways that policymakers may not anticipate. By incentive, we mean anything that offers rewards to people who change their behavior. So incentives can be prices, fines, fees, bonuses, subsidies, or non-monetary things. Very often in this course, we think of incentives as simply being prices, right? So changes in price ought to change behavior. Another principle, there are gains from trade. So this is a really important uh, outcome in economics. The idea that there are gains to be had from trade. We're better off with trade than being self-sufficient. So in a market economy, individuals engage in trade. They provide goods and services to others and receive goods and services in return. There are gains from trade, meaning people can get more of what they want through trade than they could if they tried to be self-sufficient. Where does this come from? How is that possible? Well, the idea is we can get an increase in total output via specialization. If each person specializes in the task that they're good at performing, we get more total things, which we can then bargain over later. So the idea is that through trade, this allows for the ability to specialize and this boosts the total productivity um, and can lead to uh, sort of increased um, economic prosperity for those involved, right? There's gains from trade. Another principle, markets move towards equilibrium. So that we assume there's this tendency for markets to want to be in equilibrium. Equilibrium is a situation where no individual would be better off doing something different, right? There's no further changes to your plan of behavior that could make you better off. If that's true, then we're in equilibrium. So this is a consequence of the fact that people respond to incentives. So if people respond to the price incentive, buyers and sellers, moving the market to equilibrium such that the amount the, markets, the, amount the market's supplying matches the amount the market's demanding. So to illustrate, suppose a hurricane destroys oil refineries and this reduces the amount of gasoline available. 
we might expect that this is going to cause uh, long lines as people are waiting to fill in their to fill their tank with increasingly um, smaller amounts of gasoline available. Well, waiting in line means there's a large time cost involved. You know, some people are going to get discouraged and think, well, I really don't need gasoline this bad. You know, the opportunity cost of staying in line might be substantial. And if the opportunity cost, the time lost spending in line, standing in line, exceeds the benefit of that gasoline, people are going to leave the line, right? And when people leave the line, this wait time decreases for everyone else, and we achieve uh, something closer to equilibrium as a result of other people responding to this, to this uh, incentive or disincentive, as the case may be. Another example, we can get the same effect, possibly a stronger one, if prices of gas rise, say from $2.50 to $3 a gallon, with the higher price per gallon, people might consume uh, fewer gallons of gas. Right? So we ultimately, through this price signal, this is going to coordinate the behavior of buyers and sellers, bringing the market to equilibrium. We'll talk more about this when we develop the supply and demand model in a couple of, uh, in a couple of lectures. Principle, uh, another principle, resources should be used efficiently to achieve society's goals. Um, it's a little bit of a normative statement there. We haven't yet defined normative or positive statements. I'll talk about that in a little bit. But there's a sort of general, um, general appreciation for the value of seeking after efficiency. So an economy is efficient if it takes all opportunities to make some people better off without making other people worse off. So if we can maximize the use of our resources to make all people, make some people better off without making other people worse off, this is, uh, this is seeking after efficiency. Equity or equality means everyone gets their fair share. So since people can disagree what's fair, equity isn't nearly as well-defined a concept as efficiency. As an example, we face a trade-off between efficiency and equity. Very often, maximizing the size of the proverbial economic pie often entails dividing it unequally. So if we want to maximize economic productivity, um, this is good in the, from the standpoint of efficiency, but it often introduces inequality into the system. Similarly, suppose we want to, um, suppose we want to cut the pie into more even slices so that everybody gets the same amount. This very often has the effect of shrinking the size of the pie. There's a trade-off. doesn't necessarily mean we have to do one or the other, but we better be aware of the fact that there is a trade-off here and take this into account when we're doing our analysis. Another principle, markets usually lead to efficiency. So very often the free, unconstrained market will lead to efficiency um, wherever we can find the free market. Because people usually exploit gains from trade, markets usually lead to efficiency, but there's exceptions, right? Sometimes the individual pursuit of self-interest can actually make society worse off. Maybe the market outcome leads to inefficiency. In this case, we call the situation a market failure. Market failure can be caused by uh, a firm holding market power, being a monopoly, in the presence of asymmetric information, or in, in the presence of externalities, if there's bystander effects like pollution or something like that. Market efficiency, efficiency means that the goods and services are made by the lowest cost producers and are consumed by those who value them the most highly, as measured by willingness to pay. And so the efficient market outcome, and ultimately we'll draw this with, with supply and demand curves, will show this will maximize consumer surplus and producer surplus, the sum of which is total surplus. Well, this is on the assumption that the, that, uh, that the goods and services are made by the low-cost producers and consumed by those who value them most highly. And when we say that they're consumed by those valued most highly, uh, we are measuring value most highly by wi willingness to pay. Now, I put this qualifier here because, hey, what happens if willingness to pay and ability to pay um, aren't closely correlated? Okay, so another principle, when markets do not achieve efficiency, government intervention can improve society's welfare. So the idea is, suppose we have one of those causes of market failure I mentioned earlier. Maybe there's a monopoly. Maybe there's asymmetric information or externalities. In those situations, government regulation can actually improve the functioning of markets. It can bring us closer to the efficient outcome. So this could involve taxes, subsidies, other more direct interventions to restore efficiency if the market is currently failing to allocate efficient, 
efficiently. What if the market is efficient? Well, if the market's already efficient, then government regulation, taxes, subsidies are probably going to make things worse. Um, that said, sometimes there's other compelling reasons for the government to get involved, maybe to promote equality, um, though this does come often at the cost of efficiency. doesn't mean that we shouldn't do it, but it means we should be aware when crafting our policy. And then uh, lastly, so I, I talked about positive versus normative statements when I was introducing um, uh, the concept of, um, of seeking after efficiency. Positive statements are those that simply concern facts. These are testable, and disagreements involving positive statements can be settled on the basis of evidence. Right? So if we have a positive statement, it's something that we can collect facts, collect evidence, and then determine which is correct. Normative statements are those that involve opinions or value judgments. Now, these disagreements can never be settled on the basis of evidence alone because they involve opinions. So here's an example. Um, normative versus positive statements. The first is a positive statement. Raising the minimum wage to $15 per hour will increase the standard of living for the U.S. worker. It's a positive statement because we can go and we can collect, we can collect, ev or we can collect data and empirically uh, compute the effect on, um, on the standard of living for U.S. workers where the minimum wage has been, has been risen to $15 an hour, right? So we can go to Seattle where recently the minimum wage has risen to $15 an hour. We can look and find out, hey, have workers there um, increased their standard of living? And can we attribute this to the increase in the minimum wage, right? So these are things we can, we can test. Uh, the, the following here is a normative statement. This is something that can never be settled on the basis of, of evidence. So all U.S. workers deserve to be earning at least $15 an hour. I mean, that's not something that involves facts. That involves an opinion, right? This is a statement that cannot be resolved simply on the basis of facts alone. Now, there are some positive statements wrapped into that normative statement, and we can settle those with facts. But when it comes down to it, when we're talking about something like deserve or ought or should, these are all things that involve opinions or value judgments, and therefore we're talking about a normative statement. We can use economics to give us some insights into normative statements, but really economics uh, needs to stay where it's good, <laughs> what it's good at doing, which is, which is making and evaluating positive statements. Okay, so very good. So I hope you enjoyed the lecture. Go ahead and follow up with your course reading, and I will post the next lecture uh, at some point in the future.